Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Mike Emanuel and for Brett Baer. President Trump is right now on his way back to Washington after two Midwestern stops, conveniently timed for the day after he reached a major agreement with Europe over trade and tariffs. While the president's assuring that better trade times are ahead, not everyone is so sure. Correspondent Kevin Cork starts us off tonight from the White House. Good evening, Kevin. Evening, Mike. The president's tough trade tactics are working, say White House officials, at least to bring our trading partners to the bargaining table. But they also quickly acknowledge that there's a fair amount of anxiety among some companies and businesses that are afraid they'll be caught in the crossfire. I have to say, because we have a lot of farmers in this place, we had this hat made up, look at that, this, awesome. it's the John Deere colors, actually, but <laughs> make our farmers great again, isn't that great? Fresh off yesterday's announced framework to improve trade with the European Union, President Trump today looked to build on that momentum with a trip to America's heartland. Mr. Trump using a stop in Dubuque to calm tariff concerns among Iowa farmers, who collectively export a third of the soybeans that they produce. Basically, we opened up Europe. And that's going to be a great thing for Europe, and it's been really going to be a great thing for us, and it's going to be a really great thing for our farmers, because you have just gotten yourself one big market that really essentially, wouldn't you say, Kim, never existed, because you, you just had a problem. On Twitter, Mr. Trump drilled down, boasting that the EU would start buying soybeans from our great farmers immediately. His visit to Iowa and later Illinois comes two days after Mr. Trump announced that his administration would direct $12 billion to farmers who've been hurt by tariffs, a plan critics called a bailout, a charge forcefully rejected by White House officials. This is not a bailout. This is reciprocal. Again, we Where's want come free from? and fair reciprocal trade, and that's what we're fighting for. However, the president's trade agenda has netted mixed results so far. Retaliatory tariffs have strained talks with both China and Canada, although there has been steady progress on a new trade deal with Mexico and now a promising breakthrough with the EU, the latter of which was met with cautious optimism on Capitol Hill. When you negotiate, there's a chance that you're not going to win. But you can't make progress sometimes without negotiating. And I think that's what we're we're in the middle of. Well, any time that we can sit down and start working through the differences, you know, if that's everyone has a different style, but if we can at the end result, we end up with there's fair trade. I want free and fair trade. But progress is slow. And that's particularly the case with America's largest single trading partner, China, which is intentionally targeted industries and crops in the Midwest with higher fees in retaliation for new U.S. tariffs designed to level the trade playing field, a subject of great interest at today's Senate Appropriations Committee hearing. If your conclusion is that China taking over all of our technology and the future of our children is a stupid fight, then you are right. We should capitulate. My view is that's how we got where we are. So I don't think it's a stupid fight. Mike, the U.S. has already slapped about $50 billion in tariffs on Chinese products, with the president threatening to slap another $200 billion on China if they don't back off on tariffs and obviously taking advantage of our intellectual property, Mike. Something to watch there. Now, Kevin, there's an important meeting taking place at the White House tomorrow on election security. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, spot on. The president will chair that meeting of his national security team. Uh, we're talking about Vice President Mike Pence, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and obviously John Bolton, his national security advisor, and others will be here to talk about the importance of safety and security of our electoral system. You heard Kirsten Nielsen tell Fox News just yesterday, the uh, Homeland Security Secretary, we recognize that Russia meddled in the 2016 campaign. They possess the capability, Mike, to do it again in 2018, underscoring the need for the big meeting here tomorrow, Mike. A huge story tomorrow and in the months ahead. Kevin Cork li live at the White House. Kevin, many yeah. thanks. Stocks were mixed as social media giant Facebook took a major hit today. The Dow gained 113. The S&P 500 was off seven. NASDAQ dropped 80. Now let's examine the short-term and long-term effects of the European trade deal and the fall of Facebook on Wall Street today. Deirdre Bolton of Fox Business Network joins us live from New York. Good evening, Deirdre. Good evening, Mike. Well, Facebook's $119 billion plus route, one of the single biggest losses in stock market history for any one stock. It's definitely Facebook's worst day ever by far. So the stock plunged 19%. It closed near that level. So the company missed quarterly revenue forecasts. It lowered its outlook. 
and it said its revenue growth rate will slow. Some investors are worried that while Facebook's user growth is stalling, it's spending more. The company committed to investing billions of dollars per year on developing stronger privacy measures. The company has faced bruising headlines about its role in enabling fake news and election meddling. So some see these decisions as necessary. Optimists say Facebook has more than two billion global users. It will figure out its next best steps. One contextual point, the company's previous worst single day performance, you have to go back to July 2012. The stock fell more than 11.5% at that time. The company had pivoted to selling mobile advertising and investors doubted that strategy. Now it makes up 91% of the company's ad revenue. But no matter what the future holds, today's drop sent founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg's personal net worth plummeting by more than $11 billion, Mike. Okay, so that's something we'll be watching, Deirdre. But from the negative to the positive, what are the short-term and long-term effects of this European trade deal? So President Trump, his meeting with the EC president, Jean-Claude Juncker, put a pause in an escalating trade war. So that's a bright spot. Europe says it's going to buy more American soybeans and more American liquid natural gas. Soybeans are the U.S.'s biggest agri-export and buying with more from Europe is going to counter what China is not buying. If Europe buys more American liquid natural gas, it could be a win-win for both regions. Analysts say the U.S. could become the world's biggest supplier of liquid natural gas in the next five years, which would equal U.S. job creation. For Europe, the win is decreasing its dependence on Russia. Russia has a 35% market share as a gas supplier in Europe, and Russia is unpredictable. It cut off pipelines in Eastern Europe in 2006, again in 2007 and 8, and again in 2014 with harsh winter conditions. There were casualties. Some experts say Russia uses its natural gas supply as a weapon. The business question, though, for American liquid natural gas suppliers is that they can sell at higher prices in Asia because Chinese manufacturing is on fire. So those company heads will have some big decisions ahead. Mike, Dear Deirdre Bolton from Fox Business, thanks very much. Sure. Republicans are going after Twitter tonight. They say the social media giant has purposely kept some of them from appearing in search results. Correspondent Peter Ducey reports on what some consider the latest example of ideological censorship from the left. Fox News. Congressman Matt Gates is one of the Republicans whose Twitter handle was hidden for months from some curious users searching for him. Type his name and he didn't pop up. Today, the president, whose Twitter account helped get him elected, wrote Twitter shadow banning prominent Republicans. Not good. We will look into this discriminatory and illegal practice at once. Many complaints. Another one of the allegedly blocked Republicans, RNC chair Ronna McDaniel. It took a tweet from the president of the United States to get Twitter to care about everyday Republicans voters. That's very troubling. The conservative shadow ban appears to have been fixed this morning for the first time since May when Twitter announced it would crack down on trolls contributing to an unhealthy dialogue and Twitter staffers explained some troll-like behavior is fun, good, and humorous. What we're talking about today are troll-like behaviors that distort and detract from the public conversation on Twitter, particularly in communal areas like conversations and search. Those search bar changes aren't known to have impacted any Democrats. The spokesman for Donald Trump Jr., Andrew Sarabian, claims he was shadow banned too. He tells Fox News the targeted censorship of conservatives on Twitter isn't some fringe conspiracy theory. It's actually happening. Twitter insists our behavioral ranking doesn't make judgments based on political views or the substance of tweets. Congressman Gates isn't so sure. There are only four members of Congress that I've been notified have been shadow banned. Myself, Mark Meadows, Jim Jordan, and Devin Nunes. And the thing that we obviously all have in common is that we are four of the strongest supporters of President Trump, and we've been very critical of the Russia investigation. In 2017, a Twitter employee deactivated President Trump's account because he didn't like his policies, but it was live again 11 minutes later. These new accusations of bias may be probed for months. This is no different than if a billboard company were to make a donation to my opponents and not the same donation to me. That would be an illegal corporate contract and we're reviewing our options to complain to the Federal Elections Commission about the way Twitter has treated us. So much talk about social media here in Washington has been about how the Russians used it to meddle in the last election. But the alleged interference being discussed today didn't originate at the Kremlin. It came from California. Mike. Peter Ducey reporting on Capitol Hill. Peter, thanks. 
Conservative Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan wants to be the next Speaker of the House next year. Jordan made the announcement last night and sent a letter to colleagues today. Jordan's a former chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. He faces likely competition from Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy and Whip Steve Scalise. Current Speaker Paul Ryan is retiring at the end of his term. House Republicans are divided tonight over impeachment proceedings against the number two official in the Justice Department. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harrods looks at both sides tonight. Do I support impeachment of Rod Rosenstein? No, I do not. The House Speaker characterized the articles of impeachment filed by the House Freedom Caucus as an extreme step. I don't think we should be cavalier with this process or with this term. I don't think that this rises to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Among the allegations, the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein has a conflict of interest overseeing the Russia probe because he signed the final surveillance warrant for Trump campaign aide Carter Page, based in part on the unverified Trump dossier. Months earlier, Earlier, the former British spy behind the dossier, Christopher Steele, was fired by the FBI for lying. Steele also admitted his hatred for candidate Trump. According to the articles of impeachment, quote, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein's failure to recuse himself in light of this inherent conflict of interest constitute dereliction of duty. It was very frustrating to hear the speaker call our efforts cavalier. Christopher Steele lied to the FBI. Rod Rosenstein knew that and was so cavalier that he thought that his information was still a basis to on people associated with the Trump campaign. Democrats claim the goal is discrediting special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia probe. Just when you think you have seen it all, Republicans have no shame to go to a place where they would undermine our judicial system. If it's in the service of this president, that's all they care about. A charge one key Republican denies. Uh, I haven't discussed it with the president, and so I can tell you at this point uh, who the president hires and fires is certainly not going to be influenced by something that uh, this member of Congress does. In Boston, the attorney general said House Republicans should refocus and defended the department's um, number two. My deputy, Rod Rosenstein, is highly capable. I have the the, uh, highest confidence in him. We need Congress to deal with the immigration question. The Justice Department fails to provide the withheld records. A Republican aide said tonight they have a commitment from leadership to hold a vote on a contempt resolution after the recess in early September, insisting impeachment remains on the table, Mike. Catherine Harridge, thanks very You're much. You're welcome. The Associated Press is reporting documents from a London-based investigative unit indicate the Moscow lawyer who met with Donald Trump Jr. and is said to have promised the presidential campaign, the Trump presidential campaign, dirt on Hillary Clinton, worked more closely with Russian government officials than she previously let on. The AP says the documents are from a company run by a Russian opposition figure. The documents reportedly paint a picture of Natalia Vysilnyetska as a well-connected attorney who served as a ghostwriter for top Russian government lawyers and received assistance from senior interior ministry personnel. She has previously denied acting as a representative of Russian authorities. Today is the deadline for the Trump administration to reunite children and parents separated at the southern border during its zero tolerance enforcement. Correspondent Casey Stiegel tells us where things stand tonight from Dallas. More than a thousand reunions have taken place and hundreds more have been approved ahead of today's deadline to have all children back with their families after being separated at the border. I was sad. It was hard because I wasn't together with my papa. The federal judge who set the deadline saying it appears the U.S. government was on track to meet it, even calling its efforts to reunite more than 2,500 total kids a, quote, remarkable achievement. Though ACLU lawyers claim federal authorities manipulated numbers in the government's favor. There are many other people that will ultimately need to be reunified. So when they say they're going to meet the deadline, it's only for those individuals they've declared to be eligible for reunification by the deadline. He's referring to the more than 900 children the government puts into the ineligible category. According to court documents, more than 450 involve a parent who has already been deported. So these are parents who have made the decision not to bring the children with them and then will continue to work with the court to understand how we can best comply with the order. The ACLU and other immigration lawyers claim some of the people left without their kids because they may have been misled by federal officials. It's going to be difficult for parents who are in a different country um, and 
you know, may not know how to navigate the, the OR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement System. U.S. District Judge Dana Sabra did admonish the Department of Justice for separating families without a plan in place, saying it, quote, lacked forethought with regard to keeping track of people. Both sides will be back in court tomorrow, updating the judge on final numbers and to provide a status update on its continued efforts, despite the deadline then being officially up. Mike? Casey Stegall live in Dallas on this important immigration issue. Casey, thanks a lot. Up next, a major step in improving relations between the U.S. and North Korea. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 35 in Orlando, as the Walt Disney Company says it will stop providing single-use plastic straws and plastic stirrers at all of its locations. Disney officials say the policy will be in place by mid-2019 and is part of the company's long-standing commitment to environmental stewardship. Fox 2 in St. Louis, as Missouri's second most populous county, is the latest municipality to sue opioid makers distributors and pharmacies over what it calls the worst man-made epidemic in modern medical history. Jackson County says the epidemic has burdened the county with opioid-related hospitalizations, emergency medical responses to overdoses, babies born in withdrawal, incarcerations, and child welfare cases. And this is a live look at Los Angeles from Fox 11. The big story there tonight, a fast moving wildfire believed to have been sparked by arson is tearing through trees, has burned five homes and forced evacuation orders for an entire mountain community. About 3,200 people in Idlewild and nearby communities were ordered to leave their homes. An estimated 600 structures are threatened this comes as California swelters under a heat wave and battles ferocious fires at both ends of the state. That's tonight's live look outside the belt. <music> President Trump is threatening sanctions against Turkey if it does not free an American pastor detained for two years on terror and espionage charges. Just yesterday, Turkey released pastor Andrew Brunson from jail but left him under house arrest. The president made his threat today over Twitter. Vice President Mike Pence delivered the same message during a speech last night. The President Erdogan and the Turkish government. I have America. Release Pastor Andrew Brunson now or be prepared to face the consequences. Turkey has previously linked Brunson's return to the extradition of a cleric it holds responsible for the failed July 2016 military coup. The State Department is warning American companies they could face steep fines or even criminal charges if their business involves North Korean workers anywhere in their supply chain. Tonight, another potential thaw in relations with the Hermit Kingdom. Here's senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott. Expected to be returned as early as Friday, the 65th anniversary of the armistice that ended the Korean War, the remains of 55 U.S. service members missing in North Korea since that war. 
A U.S. official tells Fox News it's anticipated the remains will be flown from North Korea in wooden caskets on a U.S. military aircraft to a base in the South. We are in a better place than we were six months ago. I think the relationship, the dialogue, there is some movement, getting our, our hostages back, getting the servicemen back. They will be cataloged and transferred to a center in Hawaii for final DNA identification before being returned to families. The return of the remains was a major commitment made by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to President Trump last month in Singapore. Some 5,300 U.S. service members are still missing there. Uh, the remains will be coming back. They're going to start that process immediately. Earlier this week, analysts said satellite photos indicated North Korea was dismantling facilities at a missile test site. With South Korean President Moon, the new U.S. ambassador to South Korea, former Admiral Harry Harris said the moves would be positive. Still, there's a lot of pressure on the Trump administration to deliver. Secretary of State Pompeo's latest trip to Pyongyang came up short on specifics from the North on getting rid of its nukes. We should view this as a positive step, but not necessarily overstate its its benefits. And, you know, we still have to watch and see what North Korea does when it comes to denuclearization. That U.S. official warned us when dealing with North Korea, it's not over till it's over. After delays, at least for the sake of the families of the service members involved, the hope is this time it's for real. Mike. Greg Palcott, thanks very much. More fighting tonight between Israel and the Palestinians. The Israeli military says it intercepted a rocket fired from Gaza. Yesterday, Israeli shelling of Hamas targets left three militants dead. Today, they were remembered. Correspondent Connor Powell shows us from Jerusalem. Thousands of Palestinians in Gaza gathered today to mourn the death of three Hamas fighters killed by Israeli tank fire. Their deaths followed the shooting of an Israeli soldier Wednesday. Fighting has intensified along the Gaza security fence in recent days, despite both sides agreeing to a ceasefire in the wake of months of weekly protests organized by Hamas in response to President Trump's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Palestinians are also demanding an end to the Israeli blockade around Gaza, with Hamas vowing to defend the Palestinian people. The weekly clashes have left more than 150 Palestinians dead and thousands more injured. In recent weeks, militants have launched flaming kites and balloons to burn Israeli fields and property. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is vowing to continue targeting Hamas until the rockets and burning kites stop. We will do whatever it takes to protect the security, not only of the communities surrounding Gaza, but of the state of Israel. In the past, the violence we're seeing around Gaza has often led to a full-on war. But despite the regular clashes, it appears both Israel and Hamas, along with Egypt, are trying to prevent the situation from escalating further. But that might be easier to say than to actually do. Mike? Connor Powell from Jerusalem, thanks very much. Up next, the winners and losers from the president's trade and tariff policy. First, beyond our borders tonight, at least 216 people have died from coordinated attacks by ISIS on a typically peaceful area of southern Syria. Mass funerals were held today. The area was the scene of several suicide bombings, including one at a busy vegetable market that left devastation and set in motion the coordinated assaults. Authorities in Poland have banned swimming at more than 50 Baltic Sea beaches after hot weather led to the toxic growth of bacteria in the unusually warm water. Regional sanitary officials have issued warnings saying contact with the bacteria may cause allergies and rashes. Drinking contaminated water can also lead to serious digestive problems. Yuck. The British government says doctors will now be able to legally prescribe cannabis-based medicines the decision follows criticism over the denial of medical treatment to severely epileptic children. The government says it has no plans to decriminalize the drug for recreational use. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. As we told you at the top of the newscast, President Trump visited a pair of sites in the Midwest today to talk about trade, tariffs and the economy. Tonight, correspondent Leland Vitter takes a look at, at winners and losers and how the tariffs are affecting the politics of the families. 
The silence of this nail assembly line represents 140 lost jobs. Tariffs increased the cost of steel by 25 percent, forcing the company to raise prices. It's bad. I mean, it, we're in crisis mode within two weeks. Fifty percent of the orders that we had on the books were gone. And it keeps getting worse. And it keeps getting worse. Mexican-owned Mid-Continent is America's largest nail manufacturer and says they will close completely without a tariff waiver, leaving 500 out of a job in Poplar Bluff, Missouri. As we walked around the factory floor, Philip Bennett's toolbox grabbed our attention. This is his fiance. She works here, too. This is his daughter. She has a congenital heart defect. Now the man who voted for President Trump is looking to a Democratic senator to save his family's livelihood and his daughter's insurance. I want to save this company. Claire McCaskill spoke at a Senate wrong. committee hearing last yeah. month about the company and is in a tight race for a third term from a state President Trump won by 18 points. Claire came here and is actually fighting for us. I haven't seen the other guy do anything. The other guy is 2018 Senate candidate, Republican Attorney General. We need Josh badly. And President Trump endorsee Josh Hawley. I think they make a strong case uh, for an exclusion. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we have got to get better deals across the board. This aluminum is coming out at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It might as well be liquid gold for these workers. 300 people hired since the tariffs came in and helped bring this plant back that's been closed for more than two years. President Trump gave us a chance to fight on a level playing field with these tariffs. We've taken advantage of that. We're thankful to the administration for it happening. We caught up with the Cummins family of workers at Magnitude 7 Metals, three of the more than 300 workers hired. All three of you supported President Trump? Oh, yes, sir. He, he kept his word. He's kept his word on everything he said, as far as I'm concerned. And they will listen to the president when it comes to supporting Josh Hawley. In New Madrid, Missouri, Leland Vittert, Fox News. Wow. A federal appeals court has upheld a lower court ruling blocking an Indiana mandate forcing women to undergo an ultrasound at least 18 hours before having an abortion. The ultrasound waiting period law was signed by then Indiana Governor Mike Pence in March of 2016. There may be a glimmer of hope tonight for families dealing with a terrible disease striking millions. Correspondent Julian Turner tells us about a new drug that might help slow the mental decline of Alzheimer's patients. Potentially, this is a breakthrough drug. The long and discouraging medical quest to find a treatment for Alzheimer's disease is looking promising thanks to newly released results from a large-scale clinical trial. Phase 2 test results for a new drug known as BAN 2401 were rolled out at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in Chicago yesterday, and it's setting the medical community abuzz with hope. There's a great feeling um, of progress happening in the field. Everyone was very excited to hear the release of these uh, results. Preliminary results show BAN 2401 may have the ability to successfully attack both changes to the brain brought about by the growth of plaque and the symptoms it causes. There's currently no effective treatment for Alzheimer's aside from a couple of medications that slow down memory decline for a period of months. But according to the Alzheimer's Association, the global urgency to better treat and prevent Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is higher than ever and growing. This disease is devastating for Americans. 5.7 million currently live with it, and by 2050, this number will rise to 14 million. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services released a national plan to address Alzheimer's disease that seeks to find a treatment by 2025. BAN 2401 may be the most hopeful piece of that puzzle. Now, if this pans out in larger studies, this is what we would call a disease-modifying drug, which is something that the field does not yet have. Experts also caution there's still a very long road ahead and probably years before BAN 2401 gets approved for patient use. The Japanese company that developed the drug just recently submitted an FDA request to initiate that approval process. Until then, someone in America is diagnosed with Alzheimer's every 65 seconds. Mike? Jillian Turner reporting. Jillian, thanks very much. As Republicans accuse Twitter of shadow banning, we'll look at social media politics.
when people search on Twitter for an account that they might want to follow, typically those search results auto-complete or auto-fill in. But if people were searching for me or other prominent conservatives in the Congress, our accounts weren't coming up. That was not the same treatment given to Nancy Pelosi and Maxine Waters and others on the left. Kind of like a coincidence? Yeah. 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 Kind of like when you disagree with President Putin, you have a heart attack? <laughs> Senator Kennedy always has a good line. Uh, then there was quite the moment on the internet when you had President Trump go after Twitter on Twitter. Twitter shadow banning prominent Republicans, not good. We will look into this discriminatory and illegal practice at once. Many complaints. And Twitter lived to fight another day. Let's bring in our panel, Byron York, chief political correspondent of the Washington Examiner, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, and Mo Alethe, executive director of the Georgetown Institute of Politics. Okay, Byron, what do you make of, was there some shadow banning going on at Twitter? Well, it appears there was. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that these big tech companies do lean left. There was a report in Vice that I think made a pretty good case that there was the shadow banning going on against Ron McDaniel, Devin Nunes, Matt Gates, who just saw, and others. Uh, this is part of Twitter's plan to encourage healthy conversation. The problem is, Twitter gets to decide what is healthy. So I, I don't think it's really a surprise. It's kind of a continuation of what we see, infringement of speech on college campuses. People leave college campuses, they go work for Twitter, and this is continued. So I think it was probably a good idea for the president to point this out and give it prominence. Molly, your thoughts? Well, he was wrong when he said it was illegal, or I don't know if I don't know if we have any uh, actual law that can be cited that's illegal, but it's definitely a problem that Twitter and other social media companies are restricting speech. If you care about a culture of speech, you want to make sure that, that you have this free flow of ideas. And I think conservatives have been complaining about this, not just the issue that was mentioned in the report of when you search for a name, you can't find it, but an actual downplaying of conservatives and hiding, hiding what conservatives are tweeting. You're seeing this across different social media platforms. It's partly because they build algorithms that have the bias built into it. They, pri they privilege certain types of communication and, and uh, punish other types of communication. And it's a very frustrating experience. You see a lot of people who want to control the discourse in regular media and social media, and it actually leads to a lot of frustration among the average population. Here's more from Florida Congressman Matt Gates about this very issue. There are only four members of Congress that I've been notified have been shadow banned. Myself, Mark Meadows, Jim Jordan, and Devin Nunes. And the thing that we obviously all have in common is that we are four of the strongest supporters of President Trump, and we've been very critical of the Russia investigation. So I don't know if that's the reason why we were supposedly inadvertently caught in Twitter's troll trap, but it seems yes, very suspicious to me. Mo, your thoughts? Uh, first, I just I have to say, as someone who works on the college campus that invites a lot of people from both sides of the aisle, um, I, I couldn't let your comment about college campuses go by without a simple, without at least a subtle pushback, Byron. Well, Look, we'll exclude yours. <laughs> I appreciate that. Look, when when Twitter announced back in May how they were going to go after trolling, mm -hmm. my initial thought when I read it was, okay, this is good. Going, you know pushing for more civil discourse on social media is a good thing. Uh, trying to push back on those who are trying to disrupt conversation is a good thing. But I remember also thinking they're going to get stuck here. They're going to hit, they're going to catch the wrong people. Right. And it seems that this is what is happening here. The fact that Ronna Romney McDaniel uh, had this problem, but someone like an Alex Jones at Infowars didn't, right. that seems to be counterintuitive to what they're trying to do. Here's the problem. These social media companies are trying to be good citizens and encourage good debate and good conversation. They're trying to prevent themselves from being manipulated or being used as organizing tools by hate groups or by foreign governments. But at the same time, they want to be platforms for free speech. They're seeing it as a challenge to do all of those things. Uh, I, I, I applaud the effort for civil discourse. But they, they've shown that they still have some work to do to figure out how to do it right. Okay, next issue, election security. We expect a meeting tomorrow at the White House. Take a listen to this exchange. We got to make sure that we have the right kind of information sharing with states, with secretaries of states, and um, with anybody else that could, be, that could see a cyber threat from Russia. House Republicans refuse to act for any oversight, any funding, uh, because they are now more concerned about covering up President Trump's activities than defending our democracy from foreign attack. 
So here we are three plus months away from the next election. How alarmed should we be, Mo? Uh, I think we should be alarmed. Look, I think every independent analyst um, that has looked at uh, our our elections systems, not from a nonpartisan perspective, keep pointing to holes in the systems and areas where we are or where we're vulnerable. Sure. And I would love to see our federal government, in a bipartisan way, step forward. I don't think any administration has done what it's needed to do in recent times. Step forward and and figure out how to plug those holes. I think the strength of our system is actually how decentralized it is, though. This this is very much a local and state issue, and if people care about it, they should they should tackle it at the local level. The more you centralize election systems, the more vulnerable they are, and the more valuable those hacks become. You more and we support to the states though to but, do it. And we have known about this for a long time. We have we're having warnings right now, but we've had warnings for four years or more about China trying to do the same thing. So we should be on guard against many foreign entities. Yes. Byron, this, this White House meeting, if only for the optics and PR of this, they should have had this a long time ago. It is you know the the, the, the midterms are less than. 100 Hundred days away, and and we've had so many accusations that the uh, Trump administration has done nothing to try to stop Russian and other foreign meddling in in these upcoming elections. When in fact, some of the intelligence agencies apparently have been working on this, but they won't talk about it. So, the, uh, some sort of public sign that the president and the government are actually doing something is really overdue. Something I'd like to get to quickly is the race for House Speaker for the next Congress is heating up. Here we are, about a hundred days out. What do you make of it, Byron? Uh, I think you're. Seeing with the with the entry of Jim Jordan in the race, I think you're seeing the same dynamics that have driven Republicans in the House crazy, the same dynamic that drew John Boehner crazy, and the same dynamic that has driven Paul Ryan crazy is now showing up again, which is a group of 40 or 50 really conservative Republicans uh, disagreeing with the rest of the party on a lot of key issues. Molly, your thoughts? I, don't know, I think it's just a healthy thing when you have races that are contested, and it helps you understand more about the caucus. Kevin. McCarthy is the clear front runner. You have a Freedom Caucus candidate who has thrown his hat in the ring, and you might see someone from the left also enter the ring. In general, I think these are these are healthy things. You get to learn more about what issues the Republican Caucus cares about, and it, that will help whoever is the eventual leader know how to manage the caucus. Mo, your thoughts? Uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, Democrats are excited to see this race between McCarthy and and Jordan play out. Look, a lot of it's going to depend on what happens in November. Uh, and whether this is a race for speaker or a race for minority leader. Sure. And if Democrats win back the House, I'll be curious to see at what expense. When Republicans won back the House, it was at the expense of a lot of moderate Democrats. The, the caucus then got moved to the left. Uh, if Democrats win back the House, is it by defeating a lot of super sort of freedom caucus type of candidates or more moderate candidates? And that will define this race. All right, we have to leave it there. Next up. I have to say, because we have a lot of farmers in this place, we had this hat made up. Look at that. This, awesome. It's the John Deere colors, actually. But <laughs> make our farmers great again, isn't that great? Right? These are incredible people. And you know we've given them a little help yesterday. We're giving them help. And everybody's going to be back because we have the greatest farms in the world. This is not a bailout. This is reciprocal. Again, we want to come free from? and fair reciprocal trade, and that's what we're fighting for. And to the extent people use political issues to target our farmers, the president will stand up for them. Some of the latest talk on trade, and tomorrow we're expecting GDP numbers, and the president gave us a heck of a tease. It will only get better. Our numbers are fantastic right now. You're going to see on Friday what happens with with GDP, uh, a lot of predictions, a lot of predictions. I told you before, some with a five in front of it. There are predictions from 3.8 to 5.3. 3.8 to 5.3, and we're back with our panel, Byron, Molly, and Mo. Where are we, Byron, on the economy, on these tariffs? And well, I think, I think the biggest economic news of the week could be coming tomorrow. I mean, Larry Kudlow came out and all but predicted uh, economic growth of the second quarter at 4% 4, 4 or higher. And, and if you get 4% um, uh, economic growth, if you think the president has bragged about the economy before, you just wait <coughs> until there is actual 4% growth in the economy.
Molly, your thoughts? I also think the news we got yesterday about the EU moving toward low tariffs or no tariffs with the U.S. was significant news. We've had so much criticism of the Trump administration's tariff policy. People say high tariffs are a really bad thing. The Trump administration, not just President Trump, but you saw this in last night's interview with Wilbur Ross, said the strategy is to get to low tariffs. We've had this post-World War II order that kind of saw the ratcheting up of tariffs. Partly that was our desire to help a bunch of war-ravaged countries after World War II build up their economy. They don't quite need that now. Some of them are powerhouses themselves. So if you want to renegotiate this, you can't just ask for it. You actually have to threaten it. That's the Trump administration uh, approach here. And their strategy might be paying off. Here's the president talking about what he has worked out with the EU. Take a listen to this. We opened up Europe. And that's going to be a great thing for Europe, and it's really going to be a great thing for us, and it's going to be a really great thing for our farmers, because you have just gotten yourself one big market that really essentially, wouldn't you say, Kim, never existed, because you just had, you just had a problem. So um, we did that yesterday afternoon. We signed a, uh, a letter of intent, or agreed to a letter of intent, and we're starting the documents, but the relationship is very, very good. All right, Mo, so where are we on trade and tariffs? Well, for, first of all, if I'm correct, the United States was already the, the greatest exporter of soybeans to, to Europe. So to say that it, that market wasn't there before is, is a little off. Look, I, I'll be curious to see what happens here. It, it feels like we have been here before, where it wasn't that long ago that the administration announced a major breakthrough with China when it came to uh, trade negotiations, and it was going to be great for us, and then it fell apart. Um, and what we've got is a commitment for a conversation. I'm always for conversation. I'm always for negotiation. Sure. We'll see how that plays out, but we haven't seen uh, any, any details yet. We haven't seen any super strong commitment yet. And on a lot of uh, a lot of goods like steel and like aluminum, uh, those tariffs are still in place. And we see. I know we, the package talked about one anecdote with with one company that was bringing back jobs, but there are a lot of anecdotes about companies that are still losing jobs as a result of these tariffs and costs going up. So I think we should encourage the, the negotiations, but we're not there yet. One of the tweets that President Trump had earlier this week that I thought was interesting was when he complained that people were snipping at his heels and that it was difficult to negotiate when you have all this criticism. I took that to mean that he was trying to tell people, if you want to get to lower tariffs, you have to play the game here. You know, And to have all this opposition and not figure out what the U.S. is trying to do in taking on some really structural, huge structural problems with China, but also with other countries where you have regulatory barriers that prevent American companies from from selling their products in different places or intellectual property theft or really high tariffs if you do if you think the status quo is fine you're really opposed to the Trump administration doing anything if you don't think the status quo is fine you should be thinking about how to help get to this eventual goal of the Trump administration of lower tariffs they keep saying it they said it in Canada Trump said it in Canada he'd like to move to no tariffs right. no barriers if you are a free marketer if you like that you should probably figure out what's going on here yeah but the big news yesterday it was not that they reached some agreement to get there. It was that they reached an agreement to stop going in the wrong direction, which I think it, it, just stopping the threatening and the fighting is probably a good idea. Some of the tariffs are in place already and have not been taken up. But so much of this kind of history